Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Jerry Teo with the Healing Generations podcast of uh, the Healing Generations Institute, of the, a um, collaboration of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. And I want to welcome you here today. Uh, thank you so much for choosing to, uh, to join us as we, uh, as we journey, as we dialogue, as we pray, as we sit in ceremony uh, in, in offering this uh, this dialogue and and these teachings, with our focus at healing generations, uh, it's also part of a process of of acknowledgement and recognizing the so many blessings and so many teachings and sacrifices that uh, that our ancestors have made for generations. So we want to welcome you today, and and thank you for being with us. Um, you know, we we always begin by acknowledging the Creator and acknowledging our ancestors and. And I want to invite you just to just to take a deep breath uh, right now with me, and and as you take that deep breath, I just want you to settle in uh, wherever you're at, wherever you're at, wherever uh, you, you find yourself. You know, we acknowledge also wherever we're sitting, the, the indigenous people of that land and in which we are. I'm on the Tangva Gabrielenio land right now. I want to acknowledge uh, relatives there and just acknowledge the people and. Everything around you, you know, Mother Earth and Grandfather's Son, that wind, that water, that uh, the moon, the, the birds, the two-legged, the creepy crawlers, and all your family. You know, some of us are zooming, and in the background, uh, you know, uh, there's people around. And but we want to acknowledge all of our relations. And and at this time, we also call in those people that uh, that need maybe just a little bit of energy, a little bit of prayer, a little bit of a uh, little bit of our uh, those teachings to go out so that we can. You know, get to a place where where this world is is um, is more blessings and more healing and less pain and struggle, and that's why we do this. That's why we do the, this podcast, and that's why we offer this time, uh, so that maybe something that is said uh, will touch you in a way that will water you in a way, will inspire you in a way that you can then um, it can cultivate your your medicine, so that you can then be in a better place to give to others and and. Uh, as a collective uh, people in the universe, in the world, we can, we can be better. And today I'm really, really uh, blessed and honored to have, um, oh, just a good uh, compadre, a brother, uh, you know, that has been on this journey with me for ooh, probably like 25 years, yeah. And uh, we have learned from each other, we have shared from each other, we've cried together. Uh, probably it's sometimes like brothers have fought together too. <laughs> but but it's, uh, you know, we... we uh, we we've been on this journey for a long, long time, in different capacities. And you know, and, and who I'm speaking of is uh, Hector Sanchez Flores. And and uh, you know, Hector has a long history of of working in communities, of of, of offering uh, teachings, of of guiding, of of stimulating discussion, of of provoking uh, the questions and the answers that are needed. And and uh, he has served as as a researcher, as a you know. Worked in a legal office at one time as well, uh, you know, advocating for for people and and uh, and now for a long time has has uh, really been um, one of the the main anchors in the National Compadres Network and guiding uh, as the executive director. But he's also a, a father, uh, and a husband, and a brother and a son. And if you listen to him, you'll hear all those stories of, of who he is and who he's connected to. Uh, but he's a uh, you know really good man de palabra you know that that it really uh, if Hector's your friend he's he's a loyal friend to you right and he'll back you up that way so uh, I want to welcome you Hector and and give you the opportunity to greet the audience today in whatever way you'd like to well you know Mr. Jerry you know thank you for including me in the the podcast I know you've been working very hard at creating a journey of, of stories with this. And, you know, I, I didn't expect this. I was hoping that you would keep moving and keep moving. And then finally you said, ya te toca. it's your turn, Hector. And so I, I'm very appreciative that you invited me to, to share a little bit here. But 
You know, um, you know the, the proper way to introduce myself, as you know from Seed Coulomb, is really to put the context of who I am, right? Many people might know me in, in the, through the work, but before I was doing work, I belonged to other people too. And some people I knew, and some people I never knew, but I know I'm connected to. And so I'd like to start in that way if I can, uh, and begin by acknowledging the, the, the history of, of, of DNA that I carry in my blood and begin uh, on my father's side of the family. My father's name uh, it was uh, is uh, Gaudencio. He's passed, uh, it'll be 26 years in November. Uh, his father's name was Guadalupe Sanchez Gamboa. And my grandfather's uh, parents' name were Jesus Sanchez and Micaela Gamboa. On my father's mother's side, um, his mother was Andrea Valdez. Uh, her name, we knew her as Pita, Andreita. So the oldest grandchild likely rebaptized her as Pita. Mm. And Pita's parents were Modesto Valdez and Francisca Jara. And those are the, the lineage on my Sanchez Valdez side that I carry. Mm. My mother's name is Selena, and uh, her father's name was Ildefonso. We knew him as Pito Poncho. Uh, <laughs> his, uh, you know, his mother's name was Tomás Enríquez, and his father's name was Catarino Flores Núñez. Uh, and his mother's name was Maria de la Luz Orozco Miramontes, and her parents were Victoriano Orozco Pinedo, and her mother was Micaela Miramontes Jara. Sometimes people just laugh, like, oh, Hector, why do you carry two last names? And I always say, you sh you're grateful that I don't give my full name uh, <laughs> with all the last names associated. But many of those people I never met, Jerry. Um, I only knew them through family stories, uh, family lore. I did know my, my grandfather, Pito Poncho. Uh, he had a profound influence in the way that he loved us and cared for us and, and was present for us. Equally so, my grandmother, Pita, Andrea, uh, she was, I, I knew her, only knew them as elderly people, um, but, but somehow they didn't seem frail. They seemed mm. really incredibly capable, thoughtful, and, um, you know, I'm very proud to call them my grandparents. I'm sure mm. I've heard stories of my, my grandfather, who I never knew who passed when my father was three. Um, I've heard stories about how hard he worked and what he helped to build and what Pita continued, as well as my grandmother, Maria de la Luz, who was so, um, you know, I, I hear incredible stories of how she would uh, influence and guide community. So I come from good stock. And so, you know, my okay. father, you know, tried to do the same. My father was born in a little pueblito in, in, in Jalisco called Temastian, same town where my mother is from. And together, that, that Sanchez, Valdez, and that Flores Orozco family, uh, my mother and father, they married. And then they came to the United States. And my mother and father uh, stopped in Tijuana para tramitar los papeles to process mm. the paperwork. My mother said it felt like an eternity for her uh, when that process happened. My father had already been here before, and he had returned to Mexico to marry my mother. And then they came here and they started a family. And that family consisted of an older sister, Luz, Andrea. Uh, I'm the second born. And then I have a younger brother named Henry Joseph, but we know him all. As, we know him as Kiki. Mm -hmm. And then a younger sister named Selena, who lives in Dallas with her family. So, you know, that's a little bit about, you know, where my, where my root comes from, right? Mm -hmm. I was raised in California. I was born in California. But we traveled to Mexico back and forth, Jerry. We it just didn't seem like we were like, like we were just that 3000 mile journey just seemed like a natural thing to do so frequently spend summers there with familia on a rancho trabajando uh, getting in the way helping and and it was a great way to be raised from an early age up until when we were in high school and college when it became a little bit more difficult for us but for many many years every summer we're heading back to the rancho and uh, the privilege that that gave me, the connection that it provided me, uh, was beautiful. I mean, mm. now, many years later, um, I live here in San Jose, California, married to a wonderful woman named Lucy. And together we have two children. I have a son uh, who's 18. His name is Diego. And then I have a daughter who's 14. Who Her name is Sophia. And so now the question is, what is it that I do to continue to live the tradition of staying connected uh, to big families and, and the core family. Mm. And that's 
that's an important thing. Thank you, Hector. Wow. You know, that uh, it really expands how someone sees someone when they really talk about their lineage. You know, we live in a society that wants to cut our names and, and cut us off and make us individuals and, and doesn't recognize, you know, the true uh, interconnection that is really part of who we are, you know. You know, and, and, and speaking of that, you know, I, I know that journey um, probably for your parents and probably for yourself as well. Uh, wasn't always an easy one. You know, the lessons we learned along the way, we talk about cargas and regalos, the gifts yeah. and the baggage, you know. And I wonder if you can share with us a little bit about some of the lessons that you learned along the way, you know, and, and some of them may have been difficult ones, but but also the blessings, you know, that, that have come through that, that have really um, instructed you about uh, about life and, and living and the teachings that, that you carry right now in your life. Sure. Well... You know, I come from a huge family, but, you know, was really raised by, by my parents and, and there's no way to slice it. They were the, the biggest influences on my life. And I was blessed that, you know, they, they made a, a pretty good team together. Uh, mm. My father uh, worked very, very hard, um, was fortunate at some point before he married my mother to get a job through a union. And that, that allowed him to provide for us, you know, better than, than many other families that we knew that struggled. Uh, and my father had that as a fortune, it was a fortunate opportunity that came to him that I think he seized and, and, and cultivated and nurtured that. My mother was incredibly dedicated to the family and she worked in the home very, very hard. And I think together they kind of uh, created this, this team effort of how they were mm. going to, my dad worked outside the house and my mom worked really hard inside the house. And, and they seemed to provide each other the lane for doing what they did. That didn't mean that that was easy. Uh, there were times when my father, you know, union work was not present and he had to wait for opportunities to come to him. And, you know, family would get kind of stressed at that time. There were times because there was no work in California that, that he left and he went to go work in Alaska, right? And I remember that that period of our lives very starkly. You know, he he wasn't present in the home. Uh, he was alone in Alaska. And he would do incredible things to stay connected to us. Back in the day, cuando se batallaba, calling uh, was, was the most primary way. But he would send us care packages with... Uh, King Crab, you know, and mm. and all of those things. I think that that was his way of sharing with us where he was at. But it, it wasn't necessarily uh, ideal, right? We weren't with him on a day-to-day -day basis. So he'd work there for several weeks, and then he would come back for a quick visit. And then he would go back for two months, and then he came back to be with us a little bit. So me, being a person who sometimes travel for work, and I'm gone for one night or two nights, it weighs heavily on me. I mm. feel that, right? I can't imagine that sacrifice that my father had for being gone for so much uh, and working in, in an environment that was not hospitable. He would hear the stories about the sun wouldn't come up during some times of the year. And just when it looked like the sun was going to come up, it would begin to sunset all over again. And being a person who was closer to the equator, I'm sure that's very, very hard on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, you know, the, the same thing, Jerry, that, that I think is true for all families. We come from big families that are connected. And so when we could, we would support other families. And I think when other families could support us, they supported us. And mm -hmm. so there was this sense of interconnection that, that nunca estábamos solos. Siempre we were, we were never alone. We were always well accompanied. But, you know, how do you raise children in the culture that, a dominant culture that doesn't necessarily value parents that look like mine, right? Mm. My father spoke with a very thick accent. And, you know, he he did he did his very best. And uh, probably I would be short in, in reaching his, what the effort that he put forward. Mm. But, you know, they, yeah, I remember the sacrifices. Some of them were self-inflicted. You know, when my father and mother wanted to have a home in, in, in the town where they were raised, you know, it made it hard to have everything you wanted here. Right, because you were they were trying to do that over there. Um, when Theos and Theas struggled or suffered, you know that that was a direct impact for us. And so, when you come from a big family, Jerry, I, I, I frequently say there's nothing that has happened that that we address in our work in the community 
that hasn't happened in in my family or the people that we call family. Mm. You know, it's the you know, and and I think when I when I really truly think about what it is that rooted us, Jerry, during the struggles, whether they be financial, emotional, or whatever, was a deep rooted in in spirituality that both my mother and father uh, worked very hard to instill in us. Right, and um, you know, every day when my father was gone, uh, my mom in the afternoon, in the evening, uh, vamos a rezar el rosario. We're going to pray the rosary. Right, I remember as a kid. <laughs> I'm like, really again, right? And, uh, you know, and then you would go visit your abuelita and and that was her way too of connecting, yeah. right? And so you would hear, you're like, oh, if you knew not to stop by at a certain time because that's when she started her rosary, right? And, uh, and so you try to dodge the bullet, right? The prayer bullet, right? But thank God that, that they did that, Jerry, because, you know, my father said to me many times, you know, you may think you're getting away with it, because sometimes you forget to pray for yourself. He says, but you have the luxury of knowing that before you opened your eyes today, at least two women have already prayed for you, right? Mm. At the time, Pita was still alive and my mom, uh, who's still with us, you know, and, and still praying for us, right? But my father reminded us, hey, just when you think you're dodging the bullet, you're riding the wave of other people's prayers, right? So, so don't <laughs> don't think too much of yourself. Um, but Jerry, you know, the, the part is that um, I think what helped us survive in in moments of struggle were the connections that we had with family that mm. we never felt alone there was always a sense that we were you know that there was there was somebody respaldándote there was somebody backing you up and i think that gives you courage and confidence and a sense of never feeling isolated and alone so no matter how bad it was, there were always people praying with you or praying for you or doing that. And, and when I think about what it is that our family had at that time, um, I think that's what it was. Uh, that's mm. what it was. And so I'm very grateful that nothing crushed us, you know, that those moments of financial hardship didn't crush us, um, that those moments of stress amongst one another didn't crush us. There was always some level of connection and so, you know, the question is, how do we pass that on, that important value of staying connected to our collected nieces and nephews and cousins and whatnot? That's the real thing, because my parents and their parents were able to do that, Jerry. They were able to stay connected. And in this generation, in my generation, I think we've become so busy that we didn't give it the same priority. And maybe that's the work of the next 10 years for our family. Mm. You know, it, it, I'm glad you, you bring that to the forefront because we often think we have to teach uh, parents and, and, you know, communities how to be, how to be, a, like send them to parenting classes or send them to fatherhood classes, send them to, you know, and we do that. We do those classes mm -hmm. as well. But, but it, we, it, a lot of times the systems believe that we have to teach people. And, and, and the reality is that many of our families, this is what has, uh, been the root of their survival has been the root of 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 their perseverance of of them sacrificing so much in order that their children could have a better life you know mm -hmm. and you know and and you know when i um you know when I met you, you were doing some of this work you know and and a lot of the work you were doing with young men you know and 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 as we did work with young men, it caused us all of us to look back at our own journey and our own sense of, you know, we're trying to guide these, these young men to be honorable men. Well, it made us question, what does that mean to be an honorable mm. man? What does that mean to be an hombre? What does that mean to an hombre? What does that mean? And, and you know, so I'm wondering if, if you can share a little bit about what teachings you learned from your family, but specifically probably your father, your mother, your relatives mm. that that uh, taught you about that, or the other side that confused you related to mm. that, because we always had the dual side, yeah. you know. But but what informed you that to allow you to get to the place where, you know, you're at today in in an organization that really stands for certain values and principles. Yeah, well, you know, Jerry, like like any child growing up, when you're when you're feeling the oppressive nature of your parents and. And you say to yourself, well, when I grow up, that's not mm. the way I'm going to do it. I'm going mm. to do it completely different. And, you know, I'm no different than that child, right? Whether you're raised here or whether you're in Mexico being raised within the culture and traditions, 
that frequently used to, I used to hear my primos that were over there, my cousins from over there say, well, when I grow up, I'm, I'm not going to do this to my kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you recognize what they were trying to impart in us, right? And um, this sense of commitment, palabra, uh, following through with what you said you're going to do, uh, holding a child accountable, um, you know, all those things were present in my life. But they were, they were present both in, in shadows and in light, Jerry. So mm. I, I love all my tios. I, I, think, uh, I think I hold them in the highest regard because many of them taught me some really powerful things, but not everything they tried to teach me was good, right? Mm. I had some that really did some really wonderful jobs and some that, that also loved me and they didn't put me in danger, but, but I saw things that maybe uh, weren't as good as they should have been, right? But I do want to say that there was a couple of things is that my father had a strong commitment to, to people that he knew, and that was ever present in, in the relationships that I saw from him. And I've yeah. said this in other places, but I think that one of the biggest protective factors that I had uh, because of all those, you know, the, the influences of the community was that they respected my father, right? Mm. And that protected me. The men and the family and the community respected my father, and therefore that protected our family, right? There's no way that I could say one thing that my father did was the key part of that, but I know that he supported so many other people when they were in their journey, when they were going to tramitar to the United States, right? They needed work while they were there, uh, and my father was able to help them with that. All of those things People afforded a sense of respect to my father. And so I learned that como te comportas en la comunidad, how you behave in the community, uh, has a strong bearing of how the community will view you, as well as how they're going to view your children, right? Mm. And so, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a harder thing to do in a, in a bigger community that we work in statewide, locally, nationally, right? Um, that you leave a, an impression that says you're committed to that. The second one is there were many instances because my father was working so much that my mother would be the one that was primarily the parent, right? And people have said, well, she was like your mother and your father. And I think she people perceive that. But my father's presence was felt even when he wasn't physically in the house. But my mother did a very good job of reinforcing all of those incredible values of you know, spirituality, connectedness, and hard work, right? She she did that work. But one that I really don't oftentimes talk about was my grandfather, uh, Ildefonso Flores, uh, Pito Poncho, as we call him. You know, he was an older man when I knew him, uh, seemed to be soft-spoken, but very, very respected. And, you know, he wasn't caught up in all those ideals that, that frequently people associate with, you um, said gacho with people, be, be rude towards people. And so he would always kind of uh, teach me that there's this other way of being. Uh, mm. And I only knew him as an elder, right? So I don't know how he was when he was younger. I'd love mm. to hear those stories uh, <laughs> if anybody would have had them to share. But out of respect, they probably didn't. But, you know, he uh, would, would hit me in certain ways at times. Like I remember one story in particular that we had been at a rodeo in, in, in that small town. And there were people filled with bravado. Men had been drinking, men carrying around. And, and men there didn't carry guns on their hip very much. They carried them in a moral, in a little satchel. And, uh, but this man was, was pres presumiendo, showing off that he had a weapon. And the next time I, told, I saw my grandfather, I was telling him the story about what I observed, right? That this man had this big old gun. And he, I think he could tell that I was kind of enamored with this man with his big old weapon. Mm showing off a shiny weapon. And when I finished talking, he says, oh, he goes, mijo, yeah, I said, la pistola la carga uno del tamaño del miedo. Mm. The size of the gun that you carry is in proportion to the fear that you have. Mm. And, wow. you know, as a young man, it totally reframed my thinking about where a man's strength comes from, mm. right? And, and, you know, to this day, I still think about those things that, that he imparted with me about having pride in yourself and the family that you come from, but not in an oppressive way to say that you are better than anybody else. My father was the same way. Um, and, and so I'm very grateful that those men around me did this and that my mother 
reinforce those things. So I got mm-hmm. those images and concepts reinforced from a, the feminine in my family too. Mm. So, you know, I'm a product of that. I'm a product of those things. And my grandmothers, you know, both of them, the one that I never knew, but I've heard stories of, and my grandmother, my father's mother, who I knew, completely committed uh, in supporting the community and the church in ways that, that you know, I, I humble me to this day. They mm. humble me to this day. Lo poquito that we had, the little that we had, was to be shared with others. And, mm. you know, the first calf born was the one for the church, you know, and I mean, all these traditions of giving them that they that they instilled in me and demonstrated mm-hmm. to me not just talked about it but did it mm-hmm. wow you know um with all those teachings you know i mean we live in a society that that often doesn't respect them doesn't honor them and, mm-hmm. and but yet they're in us mm-hmm. right and and i know sitting in circolo with you you know hearing sometimes you being challenged like me about how do we live this good way in a society that doesn't respect, you know, does respect the pistola, you know, yeah. does respect the, you know, the the the, the bravado and 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 all of that, uh, the money and you know, I mean, respects all those material things, you know. So what is what has been your biggest challenge in in carrying the teachings of your ancestors, but living in this society, having to raise children, hmm. you know, being a companion. And then running an organization and and trying to honor those values. What has been your biggest challenge, and what do you struggle with the most in in reference to all of that? There's a lot there, but let me <laughs> let me let me try to, to to create an order in my brain of how to approach it. Um, first of all, n- know who you're collaborating with, Jerry. I mean, there are times when when you know, as 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 we do this work, we are asked. To live in the Western uh, way of thinking, which is mm. what you know between your ears, and and there's a time and a place for that to happen. The problem is if there's never a time and a place to shift and incorporate that which you carry between your shoulders and your chest, your heart, that work of the heart. So, in our education that my parents supported us through, we learned that. Western way of going to the point, Jerry, as you well know, that we devalue everything that we learned in the home, right? I don't know. I I think it's by design because they look at people like my mother and father and they may think what possibly could these people have given these children, right? Mm. But now I recognize the incredible value of everything they offered us. So the struggle is when is it important to lead with what your thoughts are? And what you know, and when is it important to shift to what your spirit, your feelings are telling you about a moment, right? And that's when the conflict, you know, arises the most, is if I could live just simply in prayer and in spirit, then all the decisions would come from there, right, Jerry? Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that that would be great. The problem would be when we get to the audit, uh, did everything get completed in order to move through that other process? Mm -hmm. So I think that our indigenous teachings of staying connected, of supporting one another, of recognizing the talents and gifts of everybody that we collaborate and work with, right? That they're not incompatible to the intellectual thinking. It's just a different layer. But I think it can be a struggle, and I, I you know, I'm going to speak personally from from me is when, when you have relationships with people, and you want to preserve the relationships with people, but things are getting in the way, and, and how is it that you can end in a respectful and honorable way so that everybody can get what they want, and even if it's not an ending, Jerry, if it's not, if it's just a transition to something new, right? How is it that you can do this so that everybody receives what they need and and feels supported in that process? Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're an organization that's deeply committed to bringing cultura, tradiciones indígenas, indigenous traditions, into the work that we do. And Jerry, the reason why we've done that is because when we go into communities, they recognize that and they tell us that they value that. So mm-hmm. I think that's a valuable thing to do. At the same time, we're a 501c3 that's recognized by the Secretary of State and, you know, has to do everything else. And so we're going to have to develop 
more muscles so that that other official way of working does not affect how we do the work in the community. That's where we rely. I, I rely, Jerry, on people like yourself, people like Mario, people like Cisco, people like Maestra Susie and Maestra Deborah that can keep that work rooted in those deeply uh, rooted traditions. And people like Nelda and Mayra and Marta and myself are making sure every T is crossed, every I is dotted, and we can do both of those things. It just requires, like in every community, somebody that has a different skill set. Everybody does. Like in Temastian, not everybody was a farmer. We had talabarteros, leather workers. We had uh, los quisían el tabique. You have to have complementary uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. roles. And I think yeah. NCN, we work very hard at doing that. And even as I was saying that, I was thinking about all the other people that contribute in yes. different ways. Isenia, Ariel, right? You know, everybody has a lugar and a role with us. And, and mm -hmm. that's what makes my job easier, Jerry. That's mm -hmm. what makes my job easier mm -hmm. about this incredible team of people that contribute to the journey of this work. Yeah. So, you know, within this journey, you know, I mean, what's what's been heavy on my mind lately is, is uh, I mean, the some of the horrific things that are going on hmm. in our communities, you know, our, our African relatives that are, you know, getting shot and killed, our Asian relatives that are, you know, getting hurt and disrespected and, and, and you know, killed as well. And, and, and then our own people, you know, I mean, it hits me real deep that, you know, when I heard on the news, 1,500 young Mexicana, este, Centroamericana girls between the ages of 14 and 17 or at the San Diego Convention Center. There's another thousand that are, you know, in, in Los Angeles and some in San Jose and all over the country. But what I think about is my own daughter. Hmm. You know, is that was my daughter. You know, and 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 the horrific things that, you know, uh, that happen along the way that we don't even consider. You know, I, I wonder if you can share a little bit about, you know, what that does to your heart, to your spirit, and our responsibility. Because our focus is an organization, but, you know, in, in terms of your sacred purpose, hmm. you know, I want to hear from you and your sacred purpose. How, how do we address those things and what do we need to do? What is our responsibility? But first, let's talk about what that does to you and how you keep balanced in spite of all the horrific things that are going on. So, Jerry, you know uh, how long this, you've been involved in the work that, that is labeled racial equity. And... I've been privileged to work in that space. And in that space, you make connections with people that look like all the people that are being murdered, assaulted, and then in your own family, like the young women that are at the border, right, that experience a horrific journey here. There are days, Jerry, when you, when you see the headline and you read it and you don't want to read the story because... It's a story that has been told over and over again. It has been analyzed. It has been talked about. And yet, las cosas happen, continuan to happen. They continue to happen. So when I hear these stories of our Black brothers and sisters that are killed, I think of all the people that we collaborate with and work with and have built relationships with, Jerry, that have children that same age as the people that are being killed and murdered, right? If you could feel what's going on on my the skin of the hair on my body, it, it se, se alumbra, right? Because it's not theoretical victims. These are real people, right? And I can't fathom that. Then you couple it with what we've now began to recognize more recently, but has been ever present. You know, we sit with people who come from Asian countries or the Pacific Islands, right? And now they're being the elders and not elders, even young people are being attacked because of what politically we've created and said about them. And then we have the people that are coming here for a better life, Jerry, like my parents did. And they're suffering. And we dehumanize all of them, all of them, our black brothers and sisters, our Asian brothers and sisters, 
are immigrant young people and parents. And, and we have cut to the point in this country where that become that had become so normal that you you didn't want to read the facts behind the headlines, but you had to to understand the depth of what was going on, Jerry. Um, I think of my daughter Sophia, 14 years old. The age of those girls that are coming and, and children that are coming to this country to re reconnect with familia, right? Um, mujeres like my mother who are trying to create safety for their children and are going and embarking on a journey like this, I, I could not fathom this journey. It's outside of my scope of understanding. And when it, that happens, it causes you to freeze. And I listen to mujeres but Jerry, the the reality the the reality is that it weighs on you. I there there have been nights where you wake up, and that's the first thought in your brain. Oh my God! And that's how it seeps in us. That's the part of this work, Jerry, that I think we don't frequently speak about. And thank God we create spaces to this cargar and release a little bit, because if we didn't, Jerry then I don't think I could be a good husband. I don't think I could be a good father if I didn't have a place to sit with people, to share, so that I could let go of that pressure because it would be completely overwhelming to just think about what the families from our Black relatives that are being murdered, right? Young men that will look like my nephew, right? This is not abstract. Jerry, this is, these are real people that I'm connected to that look like the people that are being murdered and victimized. Mm -hmm. Same with Sophia, same with Lucy, my wife, my mother, my nieces and nephews. Um, Jerry, it's oppressive. And you know, because I've learned much of this from you, the root to all of this is simple. All our relations. Mm. Tu eres mi otro yo, en la quech, you are a reflection of me. If we were able to do that when we see other people, we would not be able to do what we do to other people. Mm. But to develop that muscle, Jerry, requires us to really show up completely and saying, I'm going to work at being better. But in this country, we haven't got there yet. We know, you know people, I know people that do this work really, really well. But as a country... We struggle. And um, I know I know that for generations and for a long time, uh, people have come to this country and did their best to contribute to this nation. The, the Native people here who exist because the genocide was not successful, they, they, have, they have survived here and have contributed. Our brothers that came from and sisters that came from Africa helped build this nation and a host of other immigrants that forgot that they were come from immigrant families have contributed to this country, just like my father and mother did. And we have grown so disconnected from that story that we're able to harm other people, treat them inhumanely, like animals is what I want to say. That's yeah. how we, that's how what, that's what we've done. And to say that that doesn't affect you when you think about it, uh, I would be lying. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, um, <clears throat> I mean, we definitely, you know, talk about this COVID pandemic, but I think the the inhuman pandemic uh, that that we live in today is as devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 has caused us um, to justify and to rationalize and to politicize an inhumane way of being. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you know that's really um the impetus of of a lot of the work that we do and a lot of the work that you know people that we're connected to across the nation do and it's around healing hmm. it's around healing that that we know that hurt people hurt people wounded people you know wound other people and and we're a wounded nation we're a, you know a, a wounded nation and and i think that's why um it's so important that we talk about the medicine hmm. You know, that we lift up the medicine, that we water the medicine, because we can get so uh, engulfed in the pain and in the oppression mm -hmm. and, 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 and in the 
the sadness and and in in the dysfunction of of what's going on that we could get lost and and lose hope mm-hmm. and i think i think that's why your grandmothers prayed mm-hmm. that's why your mama prayed that's why our families prayed every day mm-hmm. so we didn't lose the perspective of that other side that spirit was still alive and that there still was hope there still was you know so you know i think you know part of what we attempt to do in general but also on this podcast is to lift up yeah. the medicina the medicine the tradition so that we don't forget that we remind each other to water that sacredness to mm-hmm. water those plantitas to water those values water those traditions sing those songs you know dance that music make that you know those frijoles or whatever whatever your traditional mm-hmm. food is make that food embrace those children love them up bless them up whatever you need to do you know yeah. and i think i you know i feel very fortunate that that we can speak about that and do that you know very uh, very directly you know and so i want to invite you you know to to offer you know because the, to the next generation you know yeah, you know, you, you, you're not as old as me, but you're getting older. You know, ya estás llegando al, al casi viejito there, you know, yourself. And, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, so, you know, I know you've learned some things in, in good ways and, and probably in, in other ways too. Yeah. You know, things that, that you would uh, offer advice to do and to not do. And, and we've all learned those things from our families. But, but I want to leave you a little bit of space to, uh, to offer some teachings, some advice, some consejos. Uh, to that next generation, you know. So maybe, maybe they don't have to suffer as much. Maybe they can, they can, they don't have to go through, and and uh, and learn the lessons in a hard way the way some of us did, you know. Yeah. I, w- I want to give you some space to just to sure. share, you know, some of those things. Well, you know, Jerry, I want to I want to wrap up the the hopefulness that I feel um, that you that you seeded, Jerry, that you laid a foundation for. That in spite of everything that goes on in this country and the realities that we confront, you we have constructed and you have led to construct relationships with people that are actively working to deconstruct that concept of que no nos vemos, that we don't see one another. So I'm hopeful because I see glimpses of it. And so in spite of what we confront, I think we have the people and the muscle to help bring those healing teachings to the country, so I'm grateful for that. When, when I um, think about like like the essence of what it is that I would think is important for young people to know, and it runs counter sometimes to where they're at in their development and whatnot, is to stay connected to those people that that love you, that those people that have cared for you, and in every family, there, it's a it can be a mixed bag. Right, Jerry? There, I, I de todo en una familia. There's a little bit of everything in a family. And the part that I think about is all the people along that journey of my life that have influenced me, right? Mm. That, have, that have laid a few seeds along the way that have grown in really different ways. So my mother and father being the first, connected to Creator, making sure that you, you offer prayers and that you, you show up in that way. That was very important to my mother and father. My father, trabaja duro. You know, um, you have you have work to do. You you work hard to complete that. That was my father's uh, most profound teaching and creating deep relationships. My mother, um, you know, do your homework, mm. earn good grades, right? All of those things. Um, but then outside of that, you know, Jerry, I I will say that before I'm going to talk about what I learned from you. I'm gonna, there were a couple of people that along the way really instilled in me a sense of uh, you can master something and you can do something well. And, and there was a high school teacher, Mr. Gordon Jackson, uh, the only African-American teacher that I had in high school, who I think saw me as one of the few Latinos in Northern California at that high school and, and really guided me and gave me confidence and in my education. You know, in mm-hmm. addition to what my parents had invested in, he was the one that cultivated that. So I'm really grateful to him. Then there was a professor in college, Paul Persons, who's since passed, who basically would say, you know, he would take on these astronomical challenges. I worked for him at a period of time. And I remember 
asking him, like kind of like Don Quixote, tilting at windmills. And I asked Paul one day, I said, why, why are you doing this? Why are we doing this? And his answer was, because it's the right thing to do, hmm. right? Not because we were going to make money in this, not because there was a, a precedent that was going to be, because it was the right thing to do, hmm. right? It has never left me, Jerry. And, you know, along the way, you blend what you learn in the home and in the cultura, right? Uh, and that... But they're separate, Jerry. They were separate. Mm -hmm, what you mm -hmm. learn in the home applies over here in your personal life. And what you learn in school applies over here in your professional life. And then there was that day when I saw you speak for the very first time, Jerry. And when I heard you speak, I was trying to plan work in the community at that time in Santa Barbara. And people were saying, how do we involve parents? Many of them Mexicano parents. How is it that we could get them to come and, and receive these programs that we're designing for them, right? Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. That was the mentality. And they send me to this thing. I was early in my career and going to, you know, attend this meeting and you spoke. And when I heard you speak, I've heard you say what you shared that day nearly 25 years ago over and over again. And people say, well, don't you get tired of hearing Jerry say that over and over? I said, no, because I'm never the same student. I'm always a little bit different. And so, therefore, the teaching becomes a little different for me. But in that instance, what, I, what struck me was, if my father would have been sitting right next to me hearing you speak, Jerry, on the drive home, we could have had a conversation without me having to interpret anything for him. He would have understood the values that you were trying to communicate to the group. He would have understood the tradiciones that you were building from. He would have understood, quote unquote, your logic model, Jerry, mm. because he would have felt them and would have understood them. And it was at that point when I pivoted drastically and I realized, uh, yeah, I don't think I could teach my father how to be a better father. Mm. I think he carried those things within him to be a good father. And, people, and you've heard me speak about my father and people, yeah. I don't want people to think like, my, my answer is people are like, well, you speak like your father, like he's perfect and, and that he never made a mistake. And I said, no, no, that's not, I don't want people to walk away with that sentiment. What I want people to recognize is that in the lotteries of getting a father, I won. Hmm. I got the best father for me, right? Now, if you want to talk about what kind of man he was and how he, the relationships that he had with, you know, my mother and my father that were probably more complex than I'll ever know, that's a different conversation. You have to have that with them, right? But my father was a good man to me, and you, your teaching, Jerry, allowed me to link that professional journey with the personal journey that really changed everything that I did, even affected the way when I was on research teams, how I viewed the community. So I would want young people to realize the essence of that term, all our relations, mm. not just the ones that come in the future, but the ones that we carry with us, right? I would want them to understand that they're never alone. Nunca están solos, right? And, uh, you know, that, that, that great teaching, like, you know, even when you forget to pray for yourself, Jerry, <laughs> uh, somebody did it for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And now... We owe that, right? We owe that. Now I understand why those rosaries for my parents and my mom and my dad and particularly my grandmother, why that's, you know, that got rooted. Hmm. But I don't want children to feel alone. I also want them to feel complete. Completitos. Hmm. I don't want them to think that they're deficient in any way, shape or form. Lucy and I work very hard to provide and, and guide our children. But, you know, they go on their own journey, as you well know, Jerry. Yeah. Um, and I don't want them to show up in any place where they naturally feel deficient. I hope that they don't feel deficient, right? That they feel completos and that there's days when their intellect and what they learn in school is going to be valuable. But in another moment, what they learn from their grandmother is going to be even more valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a long way to go to say, you know, maintain those relationships. And it's not easy, Jerry. I mean, you know, it's not. Uh, I would add one other thing. Build a team of tíos and uncles and tías, right? <laughs> because as parents, we may not be the most effective teachers at times. 
And the value of having a tío that can say, yeah, your dad's really upset right now, you know, but this is why he's upset mm-hmm. is probably more value than me, valuable than me telling uh, my children, I'm really upset at this, right? Mm-hmm. When, when Diego was getting ready to go to college, uh, you know, compadre of ours, Baba Greg Hodge said, give him my number, right? And uh, he goes, I'm really close. I'm just over the bridge on the bay. And he says, and remind him that I'm an attorney too, right? Uh, so if he ever runs into trouble, that he should call me before he calls you. And I'm like, what? And he says, yeah, he goes, because as a dad, you can't help him, right? But if he's in trouble, I can probably help him. Mm. I'm grateful that Diego has those tios. Baba Greg, if you get into this kind of trouble, this is the one you call. If you're struggling in a relationship or who you are, you can call Baba Greg too. But you can call Tio Jerry. You can talk, call Tio Mario. You can call Tio Cuco, right? All these men that are connected to him, that he has grown to know, I hope grown to love, you know, and, and that's that's the most valuable thing, I think, as a father that I could give in my son, uh, because that's what my father did with me, uh, with other men and other tias. So mm-hmm. wow. that's my thought. Well, you know... Uh... Beautiful teachings, and I think, you know, we're on that journey. We're still mm. learning. We're still learning, and we still, you know, we do the best we can and, and uh, try and lift up the blessings, but we still got work to do. You know, we yeah. still, and, you know, and I, and I believe this, this podcast is going to be airing probably around Father's Day, you know, and, and um, I want to just challenge uh, the men in, in, in a good way, in a yeah. loving way, you know, to, uh, to recognize the importance of your presence. And what that means is that everything you do and how you do it impacts mm. those people around you, your children, your your uh, compañeras, your family, everything. And mm-hmm. and and you know and and we need to uh, do our own work. We need to do our own work so that our children don't have to do the work that was really ours, mm. right? But at the same time, I want to you know acknowledge uh, not only the men but. Uh, but the grandpas and the tios and the compadres and all those and the mamas, yeah. you know, that, that play that role as well, you know, and, and we're all searching for the same thing, that sacredness of, yeah. as you say, all our relations, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, I want to thank you. Thank you, uh, Hector, for uh, who you are and uh, who you've been in my life, too. Mm. You know, uh, it's, it's that in la catch, you know, we mm. teach each other. We, we, when we uh, sometimes call each other out, but we love each other. Yeah, and it's all about love, and and you know, and and, and I appreciate you know. I uh, want to acknowledge your family, and and your ancestors, but also Lucy and the children too. You know, and and if you want to hear the other side of this, check out the podcast that Diego's on. He talks a little bit about his dad on there, <laughs> as well, and and uh, teaching basketball. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a good example of, of of all of those things. But you know, as as we go on this journey, we. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're we're on this journey uh, with the with the blessing of the ancestors, but also with the recognizing that the generational pain that they carry. And I'm hoping that today, in the dialogue that we had, in the discussion that we had, it maybe touched you and with something that can uh, first of all acknowledge the blessing that all of you are out there, and that uh, it gave you uh, a reinforcement of the beautiful people that you come from, your, mm. your rootedness. And some of us come from many roots, mm. but also to challenge us to do our work, you know. And and in this time around Father's Day, I really want to challenge the men uh, to to step up and to speak up, you know, with a sense of of honor and dignity for all our relations, but but also to continue doing our work so that. Uh, so that our children can really see el hombre noble, that honorable people. And then, as Maestro Hector said, you know, connect them with good people. You know, I think that's the that's the work uh, of of the Compadres Network, trying to build that inter- uh, interconnected uh, kinship, you know, as we move along. Hector, you have final words? Yeah, I want to share, you know, Jerry, I've shared this story with you before, but um, there was a time, you know, uh, when Diego estaba bien chiquito, I think either four or five years old, and he came home uh, from school that day. And when I got home, Lucy says, well, your dad's here. Why don't you ask him now, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, what, what, what happened, right? And so 
you know, it had been a conversation that Lucy and Diego had had earlier. And the question was that he had asked Lucy, do all Latino men work for the community? Hmm. Right? This little boy between four and five asked that question, right? I thought about all the little boys that don't think of Latino men in that way, right? That have been harmed or hurt by other men. But here was my son, he asked, do all Latino men work for the community? And I was, I didn't know where it was coming from. Uh, and I, I gave him an answer like, well, mijo, your grandfather worked for the community. Your mom, your grandmother did. We all, you know, do. I gave him that kind of answer to try to root him that this was part of who he was. But then he walked away and I asked Lucy, where did that come from? And she says, are you surprised? And I said, what? He says, when you bring men into this house, you welcome them, they come, they, 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 they're kind to Diego, they're kind to us, and inevitably the conversation shifts to work in the community. He says, Jerry comes in the home, that's what happens. Cuco comes into the home, that's what happens. Maestro Bobby Lee Verdugo, que en paz descanse, comes into the home, that's what happens. All the men that come into our home welcome Diego, love him up, and inevitably the conversation shifts to work in the community. That's what the compadres have given me, Jerry, and my son. So for Father's Day, I would love for us if we could show up in that way so that our children would ask that question. It's like, well, do all Latino men work for the betterment of our community? Because that would be the biggest gift that we could give them, that if we were working to heal, support, and love our families, our children, and our community. Mm -hmm. So when I think about the gift that the National Compadres Network has afforded me and my family, I'm very grateful for that, Jerry. There's no way I could have done that by myself. But collectively, our relationships have influenced my children. And when I think about Father's Day, I think of how many other hombres are out there doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and let's do it con propósito so that our children see this reflection and they just presume that's what Latino men do. Mm. They work for the betterment of the community mm. uh, because that's all they see reflected. Mm. Well, thank you for that beautiful story and reflection. And, and you know, um, I think that's, that's part of this journey and part of our job. How do we create um, this world, um, families, communities in which our children feel loved, they feel supported, and they see people around them, you know, their, their kinship, their mothers, their fathers, their, their tios, grandfathers, homies, partners that are doing, first of all, walking in a good way, but also doing what is important for the community. And I think uh, that's part of, you know, our teaching for that next generation, but it's part of our responsibility too as we go along. So you know, with that, I want to just thank you all for uh, for you know, spending the time with us, you know, spending the time and, and invite you to, you know, offer your, your reflection and, and uh, any feedback that you have. You know, um, we thank you for, for joining us. And I want to acknowledge all of you for all that you do for yourself, for your, your families and your communities. And, uh, you know, that in Nawake, an interconnected sacredness, because if we move together, our world can have uh, more blessings as we move along to pass on to the next generations. Thank you very much, Classical Man. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases. <laughs>